In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of the Angels, dear servers, dear sisters, dear faithful, on Good Shepherd Sunday, it is customary for us to preach on vocations. We mentioned the collection that is taken. That's a very great monetary help, and I appreciate your generosity that way. But the generosity that I'm looking for that's more impressive and also very important to me is the formation of children that, so that those children can join the religious life or priestly vocation. Very important. Now, I know when I give this sermon, I have a very limited audience in a certain way, because even if a thousand persons heard this sermon, that's very limited around the United States, around the world. But my fellow priests who are also preaching in all the different chapels of the world, since we have 700 plus priests in the Society of St. Pius X that are in all the different missions in different fields of the apostolate around the world, they're all preaching something similar. And so that's a great extension. And even after all that's said and done with 700 plus priests preaching at the pulpit, about vocations and the necessity of being generous and answering God's call, there's still just a little drop in the bucket, a little drop of needed workmen, work ladies, gentlemen and ladies needed to give themselves generously for the salvation of souls. It would be nice if there was a priest for every thousand people. That's not the case. It would be nice to have convents full of monks and nuns for every few hundred people. It's not the case. There are millions and millions of souls to be taken care of in this world. Some of them are Catholic. Some of them are meant to become Catholic. And those far exceed the amount of harvesters, workers in the vineyard. I know it's sort of a comical thing to say that there are more sheep in New Zealand than people. It's true. It's like a thousand sheep to one person. Maybe more. I may be off. I think I'm off. That's not exaggerated enough. And it's similar in the world today. We don't have enough workers. And what kind of workers are we looking for? We are looking for men to give themselves generously in the apostolate to administer the sacraments. Now, a priest is not simply a sacramental machine. He is first a priest, which means he participates in the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by extension, then, because of this union with Jesus, which he must maintain by his prayer life, his divine office, his meditation and his mass, and you, the faithful, will help him to protect that. He then goes and he's able to administer these seven gifts, the seven sacraments, in order to pull souls in to Jesus Christ, the high priest. And with men and women who want to be religious, what are we looking for there but persons generous enough to give their life over to Jesus Christ as his spouse? I am here, I give myself to you. How would you like to use me? How should I serve you? As we know, there used to be quite a variety of worthwhile vocations in the church so that there were so many religious orders to serve those different vocations or serve those different apostolates. Today, those are fast disappearing. There are certain ones that we know are legitimate or are worthwhile to apply ourselves to. And it's what makes the Society of St. Pius X sisters and oblates and, and brothers very versatile. They have to do a lot of different things. They're not just one apostolate. They have to do many things to fill up those voids. And then again, 
there's not very many of them to do that. So we need generous souls. And where do generous souls come from? They come from your families. They come from your households. And generosity goes hand in hand with a powerful, strong, formed will. A man or a woman who's been trained on what's right and wrong, and in knowing what's right and wrong, they're able to form their will in choosing, because that's what the will is, a faculty of the soul. The mind, the head, the, the highest part of a man is his intellect. And so that intellect brings the truth in, and then the will says, hmm, is this truth for good or bad? I need to make a choice. That's why the formation of children is very, very important. We can give them a lot of information. We could just take a bucket and pour it into them. That doesn't necessarily accomplish anything. If the knowledge coming in is not made presentable to the will as a good, obviously there could be bads, to make a good choice, the person's going to do nothing. And nowadays we see a lot of individuals and Father LaRue, the rector, former rector of the seminary in Dillwyn, Virginia, St. Thomas Aquinas, he said years ago to me and to us priors, one of the most important aspects of a religious vocation, priestly vocation, in which they're seen as very limited, is that these young men have no strength of will. They are very weak. And then they know they want to be generous enough to follow a good and maybe give themselves to our Lord, but then they hit an obstacle and they fold. They can't be soldiers anymore. Not as they should be, because they just easily fold. Now where does that folding and weakness come from? It's a lack of formation in the family. It's a lack of formation in the school and maybe even in the parish. Because the individual is not required to get outside of himself. He has a limitation, and he hits that wall, and says, I'm done. And he gives up. He doesn't try to push through. Which is, of course, part of our appetites, actually. The formation of the passions of a man, following on the knowledge and the choice he's going to make in his will, these passions help to dictate that. And so part of that is what we call the irascible appetites. Yes, there's plenty of the concupiscible type of um, appetites, these concupiscence. But it's the irascible that is very, very important for pursuing goals in life. End goals. Important things. Because the irascible appetite comes up against an obstacle and it says, I'm getting over this. Whereas the one who doesn't have well-formed irascible appetites, he stops there, changes his direction, he may give up. So in the family, it's very important to form the intellect, yes, with knowledge. We need to give our children a good education. But it's also very important to form that will based on everything that's coming in. And that the passions are not running away. That we do not have this inversion where the passions are in control and the will serves the passions and the intellect serves the will. It's all backwards. But that's what often happens today. How are we going to then, even if we gave them the best education and we form the will, we form the irascible appetites, how are we going to finish out this individual and help them to make a good choice of a way of life. The retreat. The Ignatian retreat. And I'll tell you why in just a moment, with the beautiful aspects, the different points of the retreat that help us to know what we're supposed to do. 
How many times I get someone saying, oh, Father, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what to do. And we say, go on retreat. Why would I do that? Because that will help you to know what you're supposed to do. In this life, we can bump around, and sometimes it's pretty, not, pretty obvious what a person needs to do from the direction of their parents, the direction of the school, their talents, very well. But there are others who have no idea. They could do anything. And they need to know what God wants from them. What does God want from me? And oftentimes, because they don't take that step to finding out what God wants from them by a good retreat, they end up bumping around all different places and maybe giving their heart and soul to things they're not really committed or convicted on. And they get in all kinds of traps and shoals of life. All kinds of setbacks, mistakes. A vocation is a very delicate thing. The priesthood, called to the priesthood, is God calling you. The religious vocation is a different type of call. We call both vocations. We even call a married couple a vocation. But every one of those is different in the voke, <laughs> the calling. The invoking or calling forth is different for each one. The call to the priesthood when the bishop puts his hands on the individual's head, the candidate's head, that's a call by the church to be a priest. Worthy or unworthy, he is called a priest. When the bishop lays his hands on his head, and as long as there's no impediment to receiving those holy orders, he is a priest, for good or bad. For the religious, a little different. What is the call there to sanctity? The call there in the religious, the monk or the sister or the brother or the nun, that is a call to sanctity, which every single person is called to. Now, not all of you can be running off to the convent or monastery because it's not your vocation. But every one of you is called to be a saint. Every one of you is called to be perfect. And the easiest way to do that is to become a religious. Because you give yourself to the three vows. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. And in a way, you're not your own anymore. You've given it over to our Lord Jesus Christ, your spouse. He manages it. It's a much easier, more peaceful way of living. And, of course, your, your union with him grows in leaps and bounds. We're putting ourselves, as the fathers of the church talk about, into the life of perfection. Is it any wonder, then, when any one of you goes to a monastery or a convent and you see how happy they are? I do. I see how happy the Carmelites are. I will visit them at the end of the month, and I will visit the Benedictines at the end of the first part of May in Silver City, New Mexico, both the monks and the sisters. They're all so happy. The happiness that we have a hard time finding in this life. Those are sheep that are truly followers of the shepherd. Those are happy sheep. And they don't have as much to worry about. Doesn't mean they don't have to work out their salvation. Boy, oh boy, all you have to do is read, read the annuals, the writings, the description of the hermits in the desert and all those early founders and what they had to do to form their congregation. A lot of temptations, a lot of purifying of self. As one good hermit said, when you leave the world... The devil in the world doesn't necessarily leave you. Because we're all in this world, not meant to be of it, but we are in it. And even if you go into the convent life or the monastery, it can go with you. And you must be pushing it back and closing those doors. I remember as a young man in the seminary, sitting there doing my studies, on some of the highest things of theology or philosophy or of Latin or of liturgy 
What seems, seems to always come back into my mind? A movie. Music. All of these things are distractions. And they had to be purified over and over again. So I want you to think about that. I talk about the retreats, and I'm going to tell you some points of the retreat that are so beautiful for helping to form a decision, certainly, for any vocation. But then maybe it's the religious vocation, or maybe it's the seminary vocation for the priesthood. And I say seminary vocation purposely because there is a vocation to try. And it's very clear also in the spiritual authors that there's a vocation to try. Whether one completes it to becoming a priest or making religious profession for life, that's a different thing. But there seems to be stages to the vocation. And I remember one wise rector said once, Young man, you spent five years in the seminary. That was your vocation. Never wasted. You can do anything with your life after that. Never wasted. But see, it's not the way we think. I'm not going to enter that door because <laughs> I'm scared of it. I'm apprehensive. Oh, look at all the things I'd have to give up. Not thinking, rather... I will give myself to this because I think it's an opportunity that I would succeed at for whatever amount of time it is. And if I'm not called and the bishop's hands are not placed on my head, fiat, so be it, I go on to the next vocation that God's calling me to. Or maybe it's similar in the religious life. You know, the religious don't make promises for life or a profession for life for nine years. Nine years of formation. Nine years of figuring it out. We don't even have that for marriage. This life of the sheep following the good shepherd is a very important one. Certainly for all the faithful, but especially for the religious and for the priests. And recently with certain scandals that have come up in the church, yet again, always pestering us. It always seems to be at moments when things are critical in the church. To try to dissuade sheep from following the shepherd. It always seems to attack the things where the most vocations come from, too. Where do our vocations in the society of St. Pius X come from? Yes, from your families. But after that, camps and schools. Camps and schools are where all of our vocations and the majority come from. Yes, you get a few here and there. I would call them random vocations from just different places where somebody is figuring out as a convert, oh, I want to be a priest or a religious. But the majority of them are coming from the work that we do to form priests. And those are the things that get attacked. And people lose trust in. It's all devil devised. Because where are we left then? It's terrible and discouraging. Nope, we keep fighting. As I say, you want to be a good fighter? You want to know what to do with your life? Take the Ignatian exercises. Father Valle, who reduced the 30-day exercise of St. Ignatius down to five, and that was given to us by Father Beriel in Icon and then passed on. He formed so many beautiful souls in Spain, especially men. And those were the martyrs of the Spanish Revolution. At the time when we know the communists were overrunning Spain, the men who stood strong were fighters. Two gentlemen laid down their life were the ones who went on his retreats. The martyrs, the strong fighters, were the followers of Father Vele because they did the Ignatian exercises. The formation of the will, again, as I told you, I know mine was greatly helped by the 30-day exercises I took in Los Gatos, California in the year 2001 under Father Francis Ocracy and Father Lawrence Novak. 
So important. The formation of the will to follow Jesus no matter what. I was speaking to a Protestant yesterday, and he said, Father, the problem that people don't truly believe is because they haven't had the experience of our Lord, and therefore they wash up. And he's right. And the experience we can get of our Lord with outside of an apparition or outside of a special, special consolation is the retreat. The Ignatian retreats gives us the touch of our Lord, formation of the will to not give up. We will do anything and everything for Jesus Christ. No turning back. What are a couple of those things that I keep promising to tell you? First thing is what we start the retreat with, the principle and foundation. Why are we here? Made to know, love, and serve God. We know this in our catechism. And the religious, both men and women, they fulfill that perfectly. To know, to love, and to serve God. After that, we need to know ourselves so the principle and foundation leads us to say, okay, so what did I do to God? What have I done that's wrong? After I know who I am and where I'm meant to go, to love, know, love, know, love, and serve God, what, what do I do then? Well, I need to know that I'm clean. To serve God, I need to know that my soul is clean. I need to know what I'm sorry for. And I need to say I'm sorry. And once I'm in good favors with God, <laughs> there's no stopping the soul. The souls, a lot of souls will not do the good that they're supposed to do because they feel like hypocrites. Majority, I would say, do that. I cannot do this particular thing of generosity for God in the apostolate because I am a hypocrite. I am a sinner. Well, we're all sinners, and none of us is worthy of the priesthood or the religious life. It's our Lord, as I told you, who calls us and invites us to do those things. So I'm sorry. I have to say I'm sorry. And then I have to change my life with a true amendment. And sometimes the, the sins that people fall into are because they're not fulfilling God's will. They are wandering around mindlessly, aimlessly. They're in situations that have nothing to do with God and nothing to do with grace and all about sin. Of course, they're never going to make anything of themselves. And they'll keep beating their head against that rock until they make a change. If it's not too late. Some will beat their head against that rock so hard you say, what are you doing that for? Why don't you just do this and this and this? No, bang, bang, bang. And then they die. What did they accomplish? There's so much to accomplish for God in the church today. We don't have to bang our head against a useless mission. As though beating around the bushes, you know, or hiding our lights or talents under a bushel. There's no time for that. So following contrition is mercy, the mercy of God. It's a mercy of God for us to go to one more confession, come to one more mass, to go on a retreat, to have a vocation. It's God's mercy. We didn't have to have any of these things. He didn't owe them to us. It's all, it's all an invitation. It's always that. So in a way, everybody has a call. To an invitation to sanctity, an invitation to do better, an invitation to step up higher, friend. Well, three things following on the Ignatian exercise of pointing out our Lord's life and how he lived and how we should model ourselves after him that follows the incarnation. Right about the time when we make our confession, it's usually a general confession of life, then there's going to be this conference meditation on Christ the King. The call 
of Christ the King. So after I've been purified, then it makes sense that I say to myself, what can I do for thee, O Christ? What can I do better for you? You've done so much for me. Look where you brought me. What can I do for you? The call of Christ the King. The call to sanctity. The call to the religious life. Or perhaps by a retreat, a young man figures out he's meant to be for the married life. And he puts away the idea of the religious life because it's not for him. It could be that powerful. It could be that determining. Watch out, though. On certain days, we'll have the shivers, the temptation, the discouragement of fleeing. But like the soldiers of war, it will be necessary to re react against one's sensuality and against the love of the flesh, the love of the world, in order to respond, to be able to say, I'm here, like Jeremiah. The Lord speaks, and I hear. The Lord speaks, and I say, like Jeremiah, I'm here, Lord. What should I do for you? And make the generous offering of oneself to Christ the King. Do it today even. I'm not saying that you're offering yourself to this religious vocation or priestly vocation, young people, today. But I am saying that we need to start by offering ourselves to Christ the King. Start with the offertory. When I hold up the paten and hold up the chalice, start there. Offering yourself with the host. Offering yourself with the blessed wine. And soon that will be consecrated to be the body and blood of our Lord. What you offer takes on such a high level. Far above what we could do with it. That's the beauty of making sacrifices and offerings. Is we give it to our Lord and he takes it to a level we could never arrive at. And it's true with the spiritual life. It's true with the religious life. It's true with the priesthood. I, I, I mean, every day, every day, as a priest, I have to think to myself, there's no way I could do this or have done this or be where I am without him. And that gives me such conviction, formation of will to do great things. The other thing would be then, the consideration of the two standards. What type of person are we anyway? Who do we plan to serve at the end of our life? Who do we plan to be with for eternity? Like I'm, I have to know Jesus Christ now if I'm going to spend eternity with him. And then how that eternity is spent with him, <laughs> I determine in this life. You know, the priest stands with Jesus Christ. Every single priest will stand with Jesus Christ facing the people. Like we had at the funeral of Father Hawker. His, his head is on this end. The lay person is on that end of the coffin. But when the priest is at the altar to be buried, his funeral mass, he is facing with Jesus towards the faithful. He is a priest. All of us priests are priests according to the order of Melchizedek. That doesn't change. When we go to death, when we're in heaven. So I hope you were good to Father Hawker. Because now he'll be judging you. With Jesus. So remember that the two standards is like the two cities. Which one are we in? Which one do we hope to finish with? Why do we keep playing back and forth between them? You would be very upset if you knew that somebody was going back and forth from China, their government to our government, wouldn't you? Who plays both sides of the street, goes to both cities. It happens, but, but nonetheless, you'd be very upset, wouldn't you? You'd be very upset if you knew somebody was in the government of China and then also in our government, as though it doesn't matter. Maybe that's not such a good consideration anymore, an image, because our government's not so good. But let's say someone who goes back and forth between the mosque and the Catholic Church. Two cities. 
one of Christ and the other of Satan. That's very clear, isn't it? Between Christianity and Muslimism. Two standards. What's the, what camp do we stand in? What life do we lead? And then lastly, the other thing would be, on the other point, is the type of man or woman that we are in generosity. What are we waiting for? We talk about three classes of people. There's a first class of person who says, oh man, isn't that a lovely sermon of Father Burfitt? Wow. And it lasts for as long as you go out the door. And there was a, there was a certain valet toss, we call it, desire to do good, but nothing happens. And then there's a second type of person who does the good for a little bit of time on condition. Well, I hope Father keeps talking that way, then maybe I'll think about it. Maybe I'll do that eventually. Maybe I'll go home and get rid of those bad records and those bad movies. Maybe I'll even go visit the convent. And then there's a third type of person who does it with his whole heart and soul. God, you want me? Take me wherever you want me. I'm yours. It's a complete offering of self in all humility. I am what I am. Take me as you wish. Take me as I am. I will try to do better. I will make that effort. I won't vacillate like the second type of person. And I won't just be like a seed falling on hard ground. Nope. I will give myself irrevocably to you, Christ. And please do with me as you wish. And that's true for all of us here. And if every one of us did that, then our Lord Jesus Christ will tell you within a couple days what you need to do for him. Father Valet says you can't convert a person in less than two days and a half. And I believe that after preaching the retreats. But as of two days and a half, there's like a night and day difference in the soul. I've seen it. That's what's so rewarding about preaching retreats. I would do it for the rest of my life if I had the chance. It's more rewarding than any other apostolate. The change of a soul. The change of a soul loving God. What camp do we belong to? Are we so generous to respond to Christ the King? What type of generosity do we have? To what level? Are we just a kind of a short-timer, conditional person? Or do we give ourselves fully? Whatever Jesus wants, I'm here to know, love, and serve God. Again, how can we not finish the sermon without mentioning Our Lady? What type of person do you think she was? Our Lady of Sorrow, standing at the foot of the cross. She never deserted our Lord. She was true blue, as we say. True blue. Be generous. Tell your children to be generous. I know we're limited, but how can we not keep preaching and thinking about these things? Otherwise, there'll be no change in the church. And don't let setbacks, scandals, anybody divert us from the truth, from what we need to be doing. We don't follow the man. We follow the priest. And the priest is our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.